And I love, I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, Eric Crystal, who used to actually be um, part of the gang, the gang of five here, mm -hmm. who uh, uh, running the uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies. He's now free. Oh, uh, yeah. but we love having him back. Eric is an um, anthropologist, and his work is in Southeast Asia. And one of the things, uh, interesting things he did, besides being also a fantastic photographer, mm -hmm. uh, so that we get to see, I bet a lot of photographers. He, um, he worked on an exhibit at the Fowler Museum at UCLA, which is what brought, my, uh, brought him into uh, his work on rice and ritual into my. Um, the Fowler Museum did a, an exhibit on rice, and he did. He did uh, part of that, he contributed partly to that exhibit. And I actually found the book that they put out afterwards, which weighs about 500 pounds, but I dragged it over from the Anthropology Library, and I recommend uh, thumbing through it. It's also full of really interesting photos in, uh, for the ritual life. So this is our one moment where we really get to immerse ourselves with a anthropologist in the food that, the other aspects of food that have really nothing uh, not so much to do with your survival or even your politics. Eric, can thank you. Very, thank you very much. Okay, well, I'm glad to be here. I've met some old friends, making some new friends. Um, food ways in world history. This is a very interesting subject. Um, I mean, let's place, face it. Everybody's interested in food. Her next year topic might be sex ways in world history. That'd be even more interesting. But <laughs> Michelle and I are discussing that, you know. But uh, let's focus on food this afternoon. Um, what I want to talk about today is really, in a way, picking up from where uh, Alan Farhani left off earlier this morning. Uh, he talked about kind of paleoethnobotany, the way people have uh, developed uh, sources of food, uh, uh, cultivated and domesticated uh, grains, and of course, uh, Sedentary agriculture was a precursor to urbanization and the development of civilization in every place in the world. And he talked about the genesis of agriculture in the uh, what he called Southwest Asia. He also mentioned that genesis agriculture was independently developed. The genesis of agriculture occurred in the New World with the Mayas and maize corn in Central America, and then with, later with uh, uh, potatoes uh, and uh, quinoa with the Incas in South America. And of course, the, the single grain upon which the most people in the world depend on for their sustenance is rice. Uh, and rice was developed not in Southwest Asia, nor was it developed in the New World, but of course it was developed in East or Southeast Asia. Some people say it was in China, other people say it was in uh, Thailand, uh, wherever. It certainly developed in Asia. A cultivation of rice developed in Asia about 3,500 years ago. It's interesting, you know, the Polynesians, the Hawaiians, uh, the Maoris, uh, the Samoans, the Tongans, the people who radiated out from Southeast Asia after the development of the outrigger canoe about maybe 3,000, 3,500 years ago, and then sought their fortunes across the open oceans, sailing as far to the west as Madagascar Island and as far to the east as uh, Hawaii and Easter Island, they brought with them taro. They brought with them pigs. They didn't bring with them rice because when they left Asia, Malayo Polynesian speaking people in this great Polynesian adventure, rice had not yet been domesticated at that time. They were kind of uh, pre-rice people. They were, they were people who farmed, but they farmed taro. That was their main the main crop, which we know is poi when we go to, to Hawaii. So rice was developed later than, say, barley and wheat. And, and it, rice followed the, followed the development of millet in, in Asia. Now, what I want to talk about today is the significance of rice in cultures that are distant from uh, major world civilizations. If I had more time or a whole day, I could talk about rice, say, in Japanese culture relating to Shinto beliefs and practices, but today I want to talk about rice and the significance of rice and the cultivation of rice in some small-scale tribal societies in Southeast Asia. It's been my great fortune over 40 years or more of ethnographic research to be able to work in some phenomenal places in Asia, to work in 
Indonesia, I worked a little bit in the Indonesian island of Bali, which I'll discuss first. I worked in the Indonesian island of Sulawesi with the Taraja Mountain people, which I've discussed last. And uh, as coordinator of the Center for Southeast Asia Studies here, I made uh, 10 or 12 uh, research trips and administrative jaunts to Vietnam between 1989 and 2000 and worked with the Ethnography, uh, National Ethnography Museum of Vietnam in the mountains of northern Vietnam during that period of time. So I've been very fortunate to be able to access areas uh, where we can understand how deeply the rice is embedded in local culture, whether it is in, of course, the, co the collective and shared village culture of common work, because to grow rice, you really have to work together. Rice, as we know, you know, California's the second biggest rice producing state in, uh, I don't know why this is happening here, this could be a problem. In, <laughs> Do you need to be on the internet? Because you can close your Wi-Fi. Oh, close Wi-Fi. Great idea. Thank you very much. Let me just do that for a second, if I can figure out how to do, do this. Turn, turn off Wi-Fi. Wi Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. And so, uh, when we talk about uh, when we talk about rice in these small-scale societies, what we want to understand is first of all, work to grow rice. You have to have water. It's very water-dependent. You have to not only have water, you have to control water. Either you'll grow rice in a highland field and just depend on when the rains come, or, in the, as I'll depict in photographs here, you grow it in highland mountain terraces where you have to construct dikes on the mountainsides to keep the rice in the small little terrace paddy as the little shoots grow and then drain it as the rice matures. Or you plant rice in wide valley fields where, once again, you dike these fields and you hold the water as the rice is planted in seed beds, transplanted, spaced apart, weeded, and then as the rice matures, you drain the water out. In all these cases, a lot of labor is involved in growing rice and people have to work collaboratively. They have to work together. And so I think, just as Alan was saying earlier today, uh, the domestication and cultivation of crops is necessarily transforms human society. More people are working together in more densely populated habitation sites. They say for irrigated rice paddies, you have to have at least 100 people per square kilometer density just to maintain the level of activity required by rice paddies. So this is, this is, this is, this is, this is important for us to understand. Uh, but rice is more than a, a labor-intensive activity. Rice, as I say here, it's a sacred grain, which means rice is so important in Asian societies and cultures that it takes on an importance and a meaning over and above its like nutritional value, carbohydrates, proteins, whatever. More than that, it has. It, it, there are myths about the origin of rice. There are stories about the supernaturals that control the rice, and there are rituals and ceremonies which draw the community together validate the common work, and celebrate the annual harvest, all of which are dedicated, as all religions are, to dealing with the unknown. And all religions are dealing with birth, death. In the case of rice, they're also dealing with the very perilous nature of growing rice in Asia. Perilous because it takes, in traditional rice varieties, four or five months to bring a crop to harvest, during which time you can have the normal climatic variations, like what if there's no water, that could be a problem, during which time there could be an attack of insects, uh, locusts, or leaf borers. There can be rust and other diseases that attack the rice. There can be attack of rice-eating birds. There could be wild boars, deer, and other jungle fauna that come and eat up your rice crop. A lot of stuff, bad stuff can happen between the time you sow those grains in the seed bed and the time four months later when you take out your little rice cutting knife and harvest that crop. To, pre to prevent these disasters, people uh, have constructed uh, ideologies, uh, religious systems, and ritual um, uh, ritual conventions to protect the rice. Now, this is what I want to talk about today. Okay, is you with me so far? This, all right, let's see what happens here. Okay, so now we're talking about Southeast Asia. I just want to make a, uh, a few notes about where we're going to be going. This, the uh, 240 million people live in Indonesia, the largest country in Southeast Asia by virtue of the population, fourth largest country in the world. The capital's in Jakarta. There's a famous island called the Island of Bali, which I'll talk about first here. 
Later in the last part of my presentation, I'll talk about the island of Sulawesi, the fourth of the greater Sunda islands, Java, Sumatra, Borneo, and Sulawesi, and small little Toraja culture area here where I've done most of my work. And then I'll also talk about uh, some folks, some tribal Thai people and the Hmong people that live in the northern part of Vietnam. I'll have a better map to show us the northern part of Vietnam uh, later. First, okay, just to talk about rice and art. I mean, rice has, okay, the a kind of a cult of rice, a devotion to rice, a celebration of rice permeates many Asian cultures. We can see this most particularly in the extraordinarily uh, uh, gifted talent of the artists of the island of Bali. Uh, so a recent visit to Bali, I took some photographs of some paintings that were for sale in the public market. Once again, so it's the rice harvest, right? Yeah, so there these folks are in a field harvesting the rice. This, it, it, yeah. yeah. Miguel Covarrubias was a uh, contemporary of Diego Garcia and Orozco, the uh, kind of revolutionary Mexican artist. He worked in the 1930s. He was a Mexican artist married to an American. He went to Bali in the 1930s. He wrote a book called Island of Bali that's been published like 28 times. This is one of his paintings of Island of Bali. And he captured the spirit of Bali very well because he discerned several things about the Balinese and rice. First of all, that the Balinese, like many people in Southeast Asia, associate rice with a female, associate rice with reproduction, associate rice with fertility. There's a connection there. The, the rice paddy and the production of rice, the cycle of rice, in many Asian cultures, it, uh, the, is a metaphor for the human life cycle. The planting of rice gives birth to the little rice seedlings. And the cutting of the rice is really the, the death of the rice. But when the rice is cut, there's always the, a special plot kept aside in traditional cultures for the rice seed, which is kept in a special place up in your attic or in a special place in your house. And this is a seed, the sacred seed, the seed that's protected by a deity of the rice. Uh, Kova rubies and others noted in Bali, and as we'll see in other cultures, the deity that protects the rice is not a rice god. It's a rice goddess, always a rice goddess. And the Balinese, more than any other people, express this rice goddess in the most uh, uh, beautiful and elaborative ways. Once again, here we are in an expansive rice field in Bali, surrounded by beautiful yielding coconut and fruit trees. And here we are in a real field in Bali. Beautiful place, fantastic, yeah. People are always asking me, Eric, how come you're always going back to Southeast Asia all the time, 40, 50 times? I'll tell you why, because it's a great spot. I mean, Jordan looks okay, but I don't know, man. Just between you and me, <laughs> just between you and me, don't let's get out of the room, okay? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, another beautiful rice. Now the rice has turned golden. When rice is ready to harvest, it's turned golden. Many cultures and peoples in Southeast Asia have extensive poetry that celebrate rice and they create it with gold in two ways. First of all, it turns a golden color when it's ready to harvest. And second of all, a rich person and a person in village Southeast Asia traditionally is a person with extensive lowland rice holdings. And you can turn that rice into gold. I mean, you can sell it and get money for it and turn, that in, turn it into gold. This is another beautiful rice field. And these are lowland irrigated rice paddies in Bali X 2009. And here are folks, they're in harvest, they're harvesting, taking in the harvest. Yeah, as Alan was mentioning earlier this morning, one of his uh, visuals, there's a little sketch of somebody uh, uh, threshing the rice. Well, here they're threshing the rice. So there's a lot, of, a lot of hand work that traditionally goes into the uh, sowing, the um, cultivating, the weeding, and then uh, the threshing and the hulling of the rice. These days, a lot of transformation of rice agriculture. We can compare this type of traditional rice agriculture with our rice agriculture here in California, up in Yuba and Marysville. That's uh, Butte and Sutter counties are our main production counties. Also, there's some rice production down in Fresno, the famous Lundberg Farms. Uh, there, oh, I'll give you an, an anecdote. One of my little uh, consulting jobs 
here when I was a, when I was before I retired was I took a group of Indonesian agricultural engineers for extend, UC Extension. I gave them a tour of California rice farms, and so and then. Uh, we were visiting Yuba and Marysville, visiting the farms, talking to the farmers. And three days into the tour, there's a knock on my motel door. Is the head of the delegation. Uh, we want to have a serious talk with you. I say, hey, what is it? Is it the food, the transportation? Is it the leader? Where are they hiding the peasants? <laughs> I mean, you showed us all these machines and stuff. Where's the farm? Where's all these people that are out there planting the rice? I said, there aren't any. All those combines do the work. Who's planting the rice? I, told, I said, like I told you, they come in an airplane, just like a crop duster, but they, they seed from the airplane. First, they use uh, le uh, lasers to make sure the field is level. And then they seed from the airplane, dump a little 2,4-D herbicide on to keep the weeds down. It's not too great. And then uh, they, use, they suppress the weeds. And then when it's harvested, it's done by combines. So the farmers need a lot of expensive machinery and four or five people to manage the whole farm of like, like Charles Schwab has like 500 acres up there. Yeah. So I said that, that I, I guess I didn't make the point. We don't have, you in Indonesia, you've got a lot of small farmers like we see in these folks. Here we don't have small farmers, but we do have, we do have rice. And, and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about rice policy later in this presentation. Uh, this young lady, uh, it's holding a sheaf of just harvested paddy grain. This is what rice looks like when you've cut it. Little rice grains are in, the, in that sheaf. And she's in her field. She's going to give an offering to the goddess of the rice. And there's a special um, offering place uh, made out of stone that's been in her field for years. And uh, that's, what she's, that's what she's doing here. Those, that red leaf Dracaena terminalis plant is associated with sacred places, every place in the Malayo Polynesian speaking world, even in Hawaii, the sacred places always have these plants. Uh, Bali is a Hindu enclave. One time, uh, 1,500 years ago, there were many Hindu kingdoms in Southeast Asia, in Angkor Wat, in Cambodia, in Thailand, in Burma, and in the island of Java. And then later, Buddhism supplanted Hinduism, and then later in Southeast Asia, in the islands of Indonesia, Islam supplanted Hinduism and Buddhism. And in mainland Southeast Asia, Burma, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Vietnam, uh, Buddhism supplanted Hinduism. So now just about the only Hindu culture and civilizations that's left in Southeast Asia is the three million strong island of Bali, where there's a range of Hindu temples. These folks here with their beautiful batik sarongs are going to the temple to make an offering to Dewi Sri. And Dewi Sri is the goddess of rice, the, well, the, the, the universally revered goddess of rice. Oh, I'd be glad. I, I'd be glad to, as long as you don't trip over my stuff here. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll just, well, we'll. we'll Indonesia, yeah. The goddess of rice is Dewi Sri. Uh, I said that I'll be talking about another Indonesian culture in the island of Sulawesi who are called the Toraja. And in, Viet in Vietnam, I will talk about the tribal Thai people. The Thai people, I'll tell you later, but I'll write down here, their goddess of rice is the mother of rice. They call her the mother of rice. With, oh, in their language, it's called Mechao. So what I'm saying here is over vast distances in Southeast Asia, in Isolated tribal societies, or formerly before world religions came in, you had universally a commitment to farming rice as a principal grain, a belief in the sanctity of rice as a sacred grain, and an idea, a concept of a deity, a female deity, a goddess of rice who protects the grain. All right, now we're coming through the temple gate. 
Now look carefully, because here's a little depiction of, that's the goddess of rice. Let's see if we can get a closer look. Another depiction of the rice goddess. Uh, Indonesia is a world of beautiful textiles, the most probably uh, versatile textile production place in the world. Rice, of course, is a living crop. And at temple festivals, when the goddess of rice is celebrated, not only, uh, images are often made out of the leaves of palm trees, of lone tar palm trees. So this is a living textile here. This thing is called, this is a living textile, and this is the goddess of rice. The back of the leaves are green. Uh, some of the leaves are green, some of the leaves are yellow, and they're held together with little, like, bamboo toothpicks. This is an image of the goddess of rice in a living textile. Can you go back with that? Oh, sure. This one? Oh, I think. Next one? Yeah, can you, what, that photograph in the center of the goddess of rice looks like a Barbie doll. It's not, it isn't. It's, it's actually done on, on either a piece of cardboard or a little piece of wood. You're talking about this? Yeah. Not a photograph. It's hand, it's hand drawn. And this is, the, the Balinese, uh, Kova Rubius was the first, one of the first to celebrate the extraordinary artistic versatility of the Balinese people. They have an extraordinary gong orchestra, the Balinese gamelan. They have their own textile traditions. They have phenomenal songs. They have their own architectural traditions. I mean, I'm not going through this whole thing in the slide presentation, but it's the most versatile place. They have line, line drawings. And when, at funerals, they make huge paper mache animals and put the bodies inside the animals and burn them in, Hindu, in the Hindu celebrations of death. But So there's a lot going on in Balinese art. Uh, expressive arts. Right now I'm focusing on the expressive arts relating to the goddess of rice in Bali. Yeah. Oh, I just love these goddesses of rice. And there's little fruit offerings in the back. Yeah. Their concept is they're going to bring fruit, flower offerings, sometimes meat offerings to the temple. And, the, the te and when they do, the temples are normally kind of open dead spaces, but when the gamelan orchestra plays, when the parishioners come in with their offerings, when they bring in their images of the goddess, then the spirits, the goddesses, the gods and goddesses come and inhabit the temple for this, for this period of time and kind of symbolically partake of the offerings. And so this is, this is a celebration of the goddess of rice and Bali. Yeah. Oh, my heavens. Uh, also, uh, the Hindu priests take their holy water and they take rice, cooked rice grains in the holy water, and they soak them in their specially blessed holy water. And then these rice grains are, at the end of, the, of these uh, celebrations in the temple, the rice grains are distributed to the parishioners, and they place them on their foreheads as a sign that they have respected the goddess of rice, and the goddess of rice will know that they have been here, they have made their requisite offerings, and, uh, and, and this is a sign they'll be blessed by the goddess of rice. The grains just stay on for, you know, half an hour. They can fall off themselves, it's okay. But, once again, stressing the importance, the sacrality of this extraordinary grain, which has supported the cultures and civilizations of Asia for thousands of years. It's a happy time. I mean, harvest time is a happy time. Celebration of rice is a happy time. All the stress about, are we going to bring in the harvest? Is going to be attacked by all these potential problems? That's all over with. Now we have the harvest. Now it's time to give thanks for this harvest and invite the goddess of rice to come to the temple. It's great. Vietnam, country of 85 million people, one time at war with the United States. Unfortunately, I've been going to Vietnam recently since 1989. I was there in 1966, a little bit during the war. Uh, uh, these photographs I'm going to show you were taken in remote areas in Yen Bai province here, or up in Lao Cai province here, pretty remote areas. Vietnam, like most great countries in the world, is multi-ethnic. About 85% of the people are ethnic Vietnamese, the folks that make your beef noodle soup. But there are 15% of the Vietnamese are ethnic minority people, mostly mountain minority people. So here we're in the northern part of Vietnam. I'm going to show you some photographs from Yen Bai. 
and also from Lao Cai province. Up here is Chungkok, the big neighbor to the north, China. Okay, the mountains, and this is Phan Sipan Mountain, one of the largest mountains in northern Vietnam. Sometimes in the north, it gets so cold that it snows. Uh, you might, if you ever meet a Vietnamese uh, woman whose name is Tuyet, it's a common name, means snow in Vietnamese. It doesn't get much snow in Vietnam, there's a little bit of snow in Vietnam. And the mountains in northern Vietnam traditionally have been inhabited by non-ethnic Vietnamese, by minority people. One such minority group are the well-known minority the Hmong. Anybody here from Fresno or Modesto Merced? Yeah, okay, well, there's a big Hmong community in California, H-M-O-N-G. We have about, I'd say about 150,000 Hmong folks that live in California. They're refugees from the Vietnam War who come from Laos, but they're the same ethnic group as we'll see here in northern Vietnam. Now here, these are Hmong rice terraces. We saw the lowland rice uh, paddies in Bali. These are the terraces, yeah. So uh, these are the dikes. This holds the water in. This is the Keem River. The water comes from springs up in the top. These are huge stands of bamboo. All right, these are terraces that have just been planted. They're just getting ready to be planted. This is a truly extraordinary environment. Uh, these folks have been living in this area for 125 years. Uh, they own their own land. Uh, and they get two rice crops a year. Now, up here on the steeper slopes, they're gonna, they plant just rain-fed rice and also some corn and cassava and other crops. Down here, they're using a water buffalo to prepare the soil for, sowing the, for transplanting the, the rice seedlings. Yeah, and here, of course, the rice is Quite, grows quite high. Another thing about, just as an anecdote, also in this area, people grow a lot of hemp. It's very cool here, and they use hemp for garments. Now, as you may know, the recent agriculture bill, bill that came out of our esteemed United States Congress, which has a lower approval rating than Fidel Castro, <coughs> actually okayed eight states to begin planting trial plots of hemp, including California. Hemp is a tremendous uh, uh, fiber crop for, for, uh, for clothes because, because it, uh, it doesn't use a lot of water, unlike cotton, and it's just it's a very durable crop. It hasn't been planted in the United States for 50 or 60 years because it looks just like marijuana. It's a first cousin of marijuana, but it doesn't have THC, the uh, psychotropic drug element, because it looks just like marijuana. The, uh, uh, the drug enforcement people have been scared of planting hemp, but that's changing in America. All right. So these are the fields that have been diked. We can see those, that it's a lot of work that every year you have to build these dikes again to hold in the water, because rice really loves water when it's young. And they're gonna transplant little rice seedlings from a seedling bed right in here. Yeah. So here's a little rice plant just in the morning dew drop, dropping off. It's ready to be harvested just about. The panicles are filled with grain, so heavy it's starting to droop over. This is like the rice grower's dream. I want to have a rice plant like this in four months, please. Any rice goddess, anything we can do to make this happen, kill a little pig, a little chicken sacrifice, whatever it is, please, so it can happen. Yeah, so here's some folks in the field just taking in their harvest. A harvest is a happy time. Uh, where I work in the Staraja area is very interesting. I was in the rice field during a harvest. I noticed it was real quiet. I mean, these people are usually got a good sense of humor, joking around. Like, really? I said, why are you doing this? Oh, the spirits of the rice don't like any coarse talk, any bad language, any people screwing around and doing the wrong thing. No hanky panky on the sidelines. Yet when we're in there, harvesting rice show a lot of respect. Is very very quiet. Another time we had a celebration at a house my wife and I had built there, and we had about let's see, five pigs were killed, and we had a lot of rice, and everybody left, and we just were kind of 
sweeping up. And my wife, Kathy, was uh, starting to sweep up, uh, you know, the leftover rice. Everybody had eaten from their banana leaves. There's a lot of rice grains on the floor. Stop. Don't ever throw out that rice. Let the little chickens come up. Let the little chickens come up. You know, or the kitties, the kid, house cats. Let them eat their rice. is not thrown away. We'll share that with them because it's a sacred rice. I learned a little bit when I was getting my PhD at Berkeley up there in Crober Hall, about 8%, other 92% up there in, from the villagers. Yeah, don't quote that, UC Berkeley. <laughs> yeah. It looks like just the grassy part. Uh, if you look, that's it's a good point. But if you look very care, if you look kind of carefully, there it isn't just at the end is the is the are the uh, are the grains, yeah. Yellow. Yeah, yellow. Yeah, yeah. So what do they do with the rest oh yes, not. Of I beg your pardon. What do they do with the rest of the? Well, first of all, depending on there, about the 1960s, there was a big Rockefeller Foundation project to develop fast growing grains of rice that would make sure it would meet the needs of growing Asian populations. So the so-called miracle rice, which is a shorter statured rice, was developed. That rice is harvested and threshed in a way different from the high growing, five feet tall traditional rice. The traditional rice you can bind up in sheaves like this and take home and put in your rice granary. The short grained and the short statured High yielding varieties of rice, you have to thresh and thresh in the field. Then the rice straw is often fed to the cat to the cattle or the water buffalo. Yeah. And it can sometimes if anything's left over, the stubble is oftentimes burned in the field, which has a tendency to, you know, give a little bit more fertilization to the soil. Yeah. Nothing nothing is and oh, the rice field itself is such a productive ecosystem, integral ecosystem. For instance, it's got water in it. Inside the water, you're going to have little tadpoles. You're going to have little eels. You're going to have little fish. Oftentimes, people engage in aquaculture. They dig out a kind of a big fish pond, in a, a medium-sized fish pond, in the middle of the rice field. And they stock that with uh, a carp or some other kind of local freshwater fish. And then when they're going to, just when they need all the energy and protein to harvest the crop, they're going to drain the field. And they're going to drain the fish, take the fish out of the fish pond and eat them. Also, there's a little side activity is the duck men. You have people that bring uh, herds of ducks, let's say 40 or 75 ducks, go through, they glean the fields after the fields have been harvested. These guys mostly sell the duck eggs, and every now and then they uh, barbecue a duck or two. So it's a, it's a system, a, a highly productive, traditionally sustainable system. And the thing about rice, for instance, uh, people have been growing crops so long in a place like Jordan or like in some other places that the environment has become denuded and devastated. We can see here, like the, the Balinese rice fields I showed in the first photographs after the paintings, those fields have been continually cultivated for a thousand years. That's in Gyanyar, Bali, one of the culture centers of Bali. Why? It didn't become desiccated because it's continually, re the fertility is continually renewed with new water coming down from the mountainsides. And the Balinese have a system, they call it the Subak system, which allows all the farmers to regulate the water so that the water coming down the mountains is shared by the people with the terraces, and then there's water down in the valley fields that's shared by the people in the valley fields. So every year, you can cultivate again and again. Now, you could use animal or human manure these days. There's all kinds of commercial fertilizer available. But a rice field is a continually sustainable, uh, productive a field that makes it almost unique. You can just do it again and again and again. When I was in, um, I think, Mai Chow, Vietnam. Oh, you went to Mai Chow? Yeah. Oh, yeah, good. We were served, um, I think they were grasshoppers or crickets. Oh, yeah. That's and because we'd been wondering, like, there was this guy with a butterfly net. Like, they fry him, fry him. Yeah, and, and we were wondering what he was catching with his net, and then we were served. Oh, yeah, they're quite crunchy. Yeah, they're quite crunchy, yeah. <laughs> yes? Are there problems um, diseases with them being barefoot? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, when you're in the, first of all, these rice patties are carefully worked. So like when you're, when you're in a rice patty about to be, uh, uh, we about to be, uh, trans transplanted rice is about to be put in. It's kind of like walking around in chocolate pudding. Everything has been carefully furrowed and harrowed and chopped up and 
not uh, not so much. It's it's warm. Most of these places kind of warm. Remember, you're in the tropics. I mean, this is a very productive. You're basically just a few degrees north or south of the equator in a place like Bali. This is in Vietnam. You're a bit north, but no, it's uh, no, this doesn't seem to be a, a problem. I mean, unless you got heavy, you know, rubber boots, then and you can't go in here with zoris because you can't walk in. You know, they're, they're going to get stuck in the mud. So, you know. These are Hmong, Hmong farmers. The Hmong are such an interesting group. Uh, I have to say, just 10 days ago, I was at a wonderful Hmong ceremony in Fresno, which is calling the soul of a the ancestors of a baby for a baby naming ceremony. And they did present rice to their ancestors at their front door because, once again, the ancestors always like rice. Well, these are Hmong farmers in northern Vietnam. The Hmong are a group of people who are more numerous, about 7 million, than Tibetans in the world. America has a Hmong population of between 300 and 350,000 as a result of the Vietnam War. This is, okay, this is, so you can see the rice grains here, you can see the ripe rice grains. Yeah, these are the black mong of Sapa. You probably went to Sapa too. Yeah. So, yeah. This stuff is very heavy. This is the old kind of rice. Now, another way of respecting the rice goddess in traditional cultures for the old variety of tall growing rice, you only want to use a little, little knife, a little rice cutting knife, because the goddess of the rice is happier when you use your little, little knife. For the, new, the, the high yielding varieties that grow low on the ground, it's not practical. You have to use a scythe, so that doesn't, kind of doesn't count. I was in a Hmong store in Merced a couple years ago, and I said to the lady who'd come back from a shopping trip to Laos, I said, I know what that is. That is a little rice cutting knife. She said, Okay, take it. It's yours for free. Nobody, no other, no other white ever walked in here and knew what that was. I said, All right, we're on the same page, madam. <laughs> it's a happy time. How much rice is needed to feed each person? Uh, that's a difficult thing to say. In most areas, like mountain areas, you don't grow enough rice to subsist solely on rice. So most mountain growing areas, people also grow corn, maize, which originally, of course, comes from the New World. They also grow uh, cassava, which is a um, dry season crop, which doesn't have too, much, uh, too many vitamins, but it's easy to grow. They also grow uh, sweet potatoes. In some places, you can grow taro or sago. So there are supplementary grains. Also, millet is sometimes grown. So most of these mountain areas, you can't quite grow enough rice. So, and rice is definitely a rich man's food. I mean, if poor people are going to eat more corn and potatoes and cassava than rice. Rice is always used for celebrations, for ceremonies. There's a, uh, I don't want to put any slides of Japan in here because of time constraints, but at Japanese New Year's and many other Asian New Year's, people take glutinous rice and steam it, and then they pound it into a special so-called rice cake called mochi, a sticky rice cake. We can buy these at Tokyo Fish Market here, or at every Buddhist temple, Japanese Buddhist temple sells this in the New York Times. These rice cakes are used in Chinese culture, Japanese culture, Mien and Hmong culture, many different cultures. They're like the essence of rice. New Year in Asia, okay, new, that's a problem with America. We're kind of like deculturated people. We don't like, New Year for us is, hey man, like I got in this great firecracker, da da da. Okay, New Year over, the, oh, let's get drunk. Another like great American. Okay, or a fancy hat. New Year is a religious, <laughs> New Year's a religious holiday and it's just a serious religious holiday. And what it really does, what it's really doing is, is anticipating the new planting season. It's anticipation of the rains coming and the time to take out those carefully guarded rice seed grains and put a little water in them to germinate them because you're going to get ready to sow them when, when the rains are coming. New Year is an important, significant holiday. That's why, like, a Chinese and Vietnamese are always so desperate to get beautiful blossoms, peach, little blossoming trees and flowers must be put on the mantle next to the ancestors. Once again, the sign of spring, the sign of the New Year, the sign of the new agricultural year. It all really relates to rice and rice agriculture and the metaphor of rice as related to the cycle of rice, cycle of life. <clears throat> okay, so here the rice has been uh, uh, threshed and hauled, and now it's going to go to the sun. These must be going to the market to sell, because people have to make money too. 
Now, uh, as I said before, I, was, I also want to say a few words about the Thai tribal groups in northern Vietnam. There are about a million and a half people who speak languages akin to the Thai language of Thailand. But their ancestors came from northern China before Buddhism came to the Thais, and actually before the people who live in Bangkok now uh, came down to Thailand. They are Thai people who actually have a script and speak a language close to Central Plains Thai, but they have a pre-Buddhist religious system, which once again focuses on rice and the celebration of the spirit of rice, the mother of rice, the Mekau. And they always want to, when it's time to celebrate the mother of rice, they know the rice mother loves to see hand-woven cotton textiles and silver jewelry, all kinds of beautiful things. They want to make an array of these things and they put on the offering spot so the mother of rice will be happy at the ceremony. <clears throat> These are, this is a Thai woman harvesting rice in northern Vietnam. These are a very interesting group of people. They uh, <clears throat> worked together with Ho Chi Minh during the Vietnamese Revolution. So they have they've had some people rise to high positions of power in the Vietnamese government, and they have a, a lot of land that's their own secure homeland, and that to, they're just like very secure in their own traditions. Now here's a Thai woman using one of these hand knives that harvests the traditional, the traditional rice, the traditional way with a hand cutting knife. Quiet. Yeah, here's her little. These people, folks are awfully nice. Here's Dr. Eric Crystal jumping out of the Jeep. Hey! How about a couple of pictures? Oh well. <laughs> this is going to uh, this going down to the field for the rice celebration ceremony. Also, on this occasion, the women chose their sarongs with a sunburst design. Many cultures in Southeast Asia, like for instance the Taraja people, I'll talk about next. They only make an offering to the rice spirits in the morning. So well, why did you do like that? And their their traditional religious system is bifurcated. Life has to do with the rising sun, with the morning, with the rice, with the ascendant rays of the warming sun in their cool highland locale. Death ceremonies only occur in the afternoon as the sun sets, as life ends. So see the sunburst design under textile down the bottom? Yeah. Of course, she, these people weave, this is woven in a village. These are the white ties of the Sun La province. Oh. And then she's got her little textile tissue once again to put in her offering to show the goddess of rice. And here, from the rice straw, the villagers construct an image of the mother of rice. See, this is the mother of rice that they plant in the field where their special rice grains are, are the ones they're going to save for the offerings next year. They plant this little image of the mother of rice there. I thought this was extraordinarily dramatic. You can see those rice, uh, the sunburst sarongs there in the background. I don't know how I got into this, but boy, I'm really passionate about this. <laughs> okay, lastly, the island of Sulawesi in eastern Indonesia. In the mountain, this is a port of Makassar here, and up here in the mountains, pretty remote area, is the Taraja homeland, about 400,000 people which I took off for and with my wife in 1968 to do our field work. I was shocked when I got a little news update from the Alumni Association yesterday. It's the 50th anniversary of the class of 64. <laughs> Shock, oh well, that's the way it goes. <laughs> it was a heck of a time to go to school, that's all I can say. <laughs> was I ever bored at Berkeley? I don't think so, no. <laughs> So we went out here, went out to the Tarajas, where these folks have these incredible traditional houses. Yeah, that's their house. Yeah, the house is oriented to the, to the northeast, the east where the sun, from the sun comes up, the north where the headwaters of their Saadan River, which gives them water for their rice agriculture, come, those are the headwaters. This is, this is their house, this is where they are born. 
Uh, when they're born, they're at the afterbirth of the kids is buried near the front of the house. And they remember generation after generation after generation, their ancestor from mythological times her fir who first came to settle this hamlet. And the afterbirths of all those generations are buried right here. And just off this little habitation site are the rice paddies or the rice fields. The houses are really are surrounded by the rice fields. These are as if they were tremendous sailing craft, you know, coursing through a terrace field of undulating, ripening rice. Yes. And these are one of the rice, this is a rice granary. This is a granary where they store the rice. These are people who are very interested in manifesting their status and wealth. If you have wealth and status, you want to build a big house. You want to store your rice in one, two, three, or four beautiful granaries. If you have enough money, you're going to decorate your granary with these beautiful designs. And inside the granary, you store the rice. When you have a, a festival, a party, an event, people come and sit on it. Or just to receive guests, you go sit on the, uh, sit on, on the little platform there. Oh, just as an aside, next time you all go to Starbucks for your daily you know, fix, you check out on the generic coffees, Sulawesi Kalosi coffee, thirteen ninety-five a pound. It all comes from this area right here. So when I first went here, I said, "I can't watch with these people. They got all this energy. Nobody's staying still. He's running around at a double speed. They can grow this fantastic arabica coffee, and they're drinking it all day long. Most places in Asia, you visit villages, they give you tea. Here, you get this, you know, high-quality arabica coffee. Whoa." <laughs> So this is extracting the rice from the granary, right? Jeez. Each one of those designs, of course, has a symbolic significance. Yeah. This is, this is the, this thing to them. This is the this is a water buffalo here, for instance. This is a the leaf of the pinang plant. Yeah. This is a water buffalo ear. Well, let's just see. I think it's this one. Yeah. Well, we can see that. I mean, what, what uh, taken as a whole, this is a rising sun. Above the rising sun is a, uh, a fighting cock. And uh, the fighting cock is a male element. The rising sun, the sun, as we know, is a female element. Everything for these people comes together. They have these huge ceremonies. One's, some are on the the right, the, the life side, the right side, somewhere on the death side. If you complete all these ceremonies over generations, then you're going to basically complete the whole cycle. And people who have had a, the largest rice celebration ceremony, uh, sorry, sorry, the largest funeral, get to put these special little bamboos around their rice granary. Indication, it's a, a necklace indicating that they've conducted the highest ranking ceremony. These are vestiges of the highest ranking rice ceremony. Extracting, the, it's going to go into this huge rice basket, which of course is once again locally made out of bamboo. I wasn't even planning to go here to do my field work in 1960. I was going to go do my field work on the coastal area. But one of my advisors at the university said to me, Eric, a local person, I don't want you to ever go visit the Tarajas. I said, yeah, why? He said, because those people have no culture whatsoever. They're dog, they're kafirs. Animists, some Christians, and the dog eaters. I said, "Well, that's something." That's. The, I said, "If I was the anthropologist that developed, the, the found out the first no culture area, I could like be famous." <laughs> so we went up. And we went after it stopped raining, uh, eleven weeks later, the monsoon. Ever stopped raining, we rented this jeep, went up there, took one look, and that was it for fifteen months. I don't know that much about rice, but I'm kind of surprised that it's still in its. Little well, that's what I store it as grain. Oh, okay. Yeah, an excellent point. So this rice has been cut from the. We saw the rice growing in the field. This is the traditional old style rice. It's cut just from the field, just so we saw this with a little knife. It's carried back and stored right in here, but not ready to eat now. Now they're going to take it and traditionally they're going to put it in, into a a wooden hull, kind of hulling. Uh, vessel and they're going to use bamboo sticks to take that uh, inedible husk off. And then, then they're going to be able to cook that rice. So they store it. This, it stays, it stores for a year or so like this. 
Also, they do a couple of magic because they believe if we do all the right ceremonies, maybe it'll double magically inside the granary when we're not looking at all these tremendous ideas. It could double while they'd be even better. Yeah. So when we get rice here, like white rice, it's gone to Woodland, like in uh, Yolo County. It's gone to the mill, I've been through that whole thing. <laughs> if we, we, <coughs> brown rice has the outer bran husk that's still on it. Brown rice and white rice are exactly the same rice, except white rice has the outer bran taken off. Here in Asia, there are two other color varieties of rice. There is a black rice. Sometimes you can go to the Thai restaurant on here and get black rice pudding. That rice comes out black from the plant. It's, 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 that's it. It's a black rice. There's another red rice we don't see too often around here. Another red rice. It's also not, uh, it's like a dark maroon rice that comes that way too. These people, for them, they have four elemental colors, black, white, red, and gold. Black is for death, white, red, and gold is for life. Are these colors, are, those are the elemental colors. What kind of rice are they eating there in, in, uh, in Indonesia? In, uh, that would be a uh, kind of rice. That would be uh, uh, medium grain semi-glutinous. <laughs> Oh no! Well, so if it was nowadays, all the rice there is hauled by machine. These days, it was hauled by hand, and so it'd be kind of a little bit like brown rice. It was, it was, it was very nutritious, very, really, really tasty. Now the folks there, I mean, they're really connoisseurs. They'd swear to me, I'm telling you, Eric, I can taste rice. You can tell if it's from my field or the guy's field. That's like, you know, 500 kilometers away. I can taste the difference. I mean, they're tremendous connoisseurs. Yeah. And they say, well, the government made us plant these high yielding varieties so we can get two crops a year, but we hate the way this stuff tastes. And they had to like plant this good stuff in secret because they hate the way this stuff, they, the government made us, do it, made us do it because they wanted to increase rice production. Yeah. Yes. That was, uh, my question is, speaking about potato famine and all potatoes were the same potato that they were growing in the Philippines. Is that what happened with the rice? Uh, no, well, first of all, it didn't happen here because traditionally, in traditional village uh, Southeast Asia, there are many varieties of rice that are planted. Okay, when the government came with high yielding varieties of rice, it wasn't so much that they had a huge um, disease, which was what the potato caused the potato famine. It was that there was a little bug called a brown leaf hopper, and the brown leaf hopper wasn't too much of a problem when they plant the rice once a year and harvest it, and the fields would be fallow for six months during the year. But when they we're planting continually, so there was no fallow time. The brown leaf hoppers multiplied dramatically and ate up a whole bunch of the rice. Then after that, they had the rat problem with the whole explosion of rats. Everybody in Southeast Asia likes rice. Monkeys like rice, wild pigs like rice, mice and rats like rice. People, everybody's rice, dogs. We, we, nobody ever feeds their dog a rice meal around here. But the dogs eat rice, they're real happy. So that was a problem when they started to almost monocrop this and they had to use different interventions to get around that for sure. There's always, you know, there was some new problem. Yeah, one, one more last question. Uh, when have insecticides been Yeah, but by now, at this point in Indonesia, there was a green revolution, the introduction of high yielding varieties of rice beginning in the late 1960s. There are, have been, they have insecticides, fungicides, commercial fertilizers, all kinds of stuff has happened, but people are, uh, yeah, uh, but yeah, yeah, they have been, yeah. Of course, all these, the high yielding varieties of rice demand uh, expensive inputs, especially fertilizers, which has caused a consolidation of fields. People with small little fields couldn't afford that. They sold that to bigger farmers, so it's kind of made bigger farms, not industrial style farms, but bigger farms. So how organic is the rice today that we purchase in California? Well, you can purchase, you can't go to, go to Tokyo Fish Market and San Pablo Avenue, get Lundberg organic brown rice, tell them Eric sent you. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying that it's not organic? I'm saying it is organic. I'm saying Lundberg brown rice is organic here. We're producing rice here in California. Right. If it's produced here in California, it's just organic. You can depend on that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just a little note on the rice. The renewal of rice ceremony. Every 12 years, traditionally, the Tarajas would go, would get together, several villages, and they'd have a nighttime celebration, recalling the gift of rice from their high god. 
They used a, a mechanism, a ceremonial mechanism called ritual of renewal. Ritual of renewal means you do everything backwards. So that, as I said before, normally rice offerings are made in the morning as the sun rises. For the grand rice ritual of renewal, everything pretty much takes place in the middle of the dark, middle of the night. But people gather firewood for months and light huge flares. And at the apogee of this ceremony, they lighten up this field. The center of the field is a huge tree. And around the tree are in place very tall bamboos, on top of which are miniature uh, milk gathering bamboos, rice baskets, and other implements of rice agriculture, winnowing baskets, miniatures that are presented to the high god that will look at the ceremonial site as it is ablaze, as it is lit in the middle of the night, and uh, confirm uh, the gift of rice. Each little village unit also has a ceremonial hut, and each, each household kills a little pig, a small pig, and puts uh, a cut of that meat and a little bit of long orenga yellow palm leaves on these offering poles. These, once again, are symbolic. The yellow leaves symbolic of rice harvest, the meat of the kind of pigs you can buy with a big rice harvest. These are all going to be sanctified by their high god. One, he sees the field lit in the middle of the night with this huge celebration. And after this circumambulation of the sacred tree, there's a little, a little drama that's enacted. And uh, I was wondering what's going to happen next. And I hear this, the sound of the baby water buffalo. What's happening here? They had some actors come out dressed in water with water buffalo horns. And uh, a guy who was a, acted as a male water buffalo made us to mount the female water buffalo. It was, a, it, was, it was a fertility enactment scene. Rice, as I said before, is uh, a metaphor. The rice cycle and rice itself has everything to do with the goddess of rice, with the female and with fertility and fecundity. So here you have an enactment of a scene where the buffaloes are mating, the sound of the baby and buffaloes is resounding over the field, and then when the actors leave the stage, other people come forward and plant little sticks of rice in the not, little sticks of uh, bamboo in the mud to uh, as if they were planting planting rice. So it's a whole ceremony using the ritual of renewal in the middle of the night to show the high god that everybody in this community over the last 12 years has had a great harvest and, you know, thanks the deities for preserving their harvest and making them prosperous. And finally, a small little baby, this is, I would say this is practically biblical, a small sacrificial golden calf, right? Wrapped with the golden leaves of this orenga palm tree is brought forth and sacrificed. Why a baby? Because it's all about Baby animals, small animals, miniature implements, they will grow, they'll be grow big, there'll be more, there'll be more baby pigs, more baby chickens, more baby water buffalo, there'll be more human babies, there'll be more rice crops, there'll be better crops in the future. And this all has to do with the symbolic significance of rice for the Tarajas. Now I have just a few more minutes here. Here's somebody leading his water buffalo through a field. And here's, remember I told you about the aquaculture, making a little pond so that you can raise fish in the pond in the middle of the rice field. The Taraja have an, uh, an archaic uh, painted sacred textile called a mawa cloth that they put out at special rituals. And this is an implement called the Tagalog. Several, I gave several leads to the Anthropology Museum here. Going through a rice paddy, trying to snare little eels and little fish uh, in the field before the field is worked. This is a, an implement for snaring and, and trapping little protein sources in the rice field. Now here was one of these sacred claws. We can't see it too closely here. Uh, the, those triangular shapes on the outside, this is a, a, a plant that grows wild in the field that indicates the fertility of the field. Here are the ducks. I told you about the ducks and the eggs. Here are the ducks. Here is the man with the Tagalog implement right here. Yeah, yeah. This is a closer view. So here's once again the ducks. Here are the fish coming into the fish pond. Look at all those fish. 
Here's a guy with this Tagalog implement. Yeah, this was this, once again, and here, of course, here's the rising sun. All having to do with rice, metaphor for life, and fertility in the culture of the Tarajas. And here's a, then here's a plowing the rice field. The Tarajas have a notion of like two water buffalo plowing together it symbolizes everybody working together for a good harvest in the village. So another Taraja textile, once again, depicts this agricultural activity in the form of a beautiful painted textile. Of course, there's a plow here. This guy's leading the buffalo through the field. Here's a little fish in the field. Here's a donkey crop indicating fertility. Another one. Here the water buffalo are going through the fish pond. These people have milk gathering bamboos. The Tarajas are the only people I know in Southeast Asia who drink water buffalo milk. Not only that, get this, they can make water buffalo cheese. Not only that, when the first European tourists showed up in the Taraja area in the mid-1970s, what did they find out? The first thing they found out was the Tarajas in one of 12 districts in Mankendik can make cheese out of water buffalo milk, only the French. Only the French would find this out. The French will find cheese when there's no cheese. They found cheese. They found the water buffalo cheese. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, this is a detail of one of these sacred textiles. These two men are grasping hands. Here's a rice storehouse here. Here's a sheaf of recently harvested rice here. Their feet is in a stone in the middle of an irrigation canal. They're working together to clear the canal so they can have a big rice harvest so they can put it in the, in the rice storehouse. And so this is the last slide. This is harvesting the golden rice in the Taraja Highlands. There we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Do we have time for questions, Michelle? How are we doing? OK, well, if, if there are any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Yes. Any, any, sorry, any what? Any, any what? Wine. wine. Oh yes, wine. Are you French by any chance? Oh, sorry. I mentioned the cheese. I forgot about these people. Now this is very. This is like a wonderful place because a wonderful natural world. They have a kind of a palm tree that goes here. That's in, in, in it's called the Arenga sugar palm. This tree. If you go up to the top of this tree at, uh, in the late afternoon, there's little growth, little protuberances come from the top of the tree. You take your machete, you cut those every afternoon during the rainy season, and you attach a large bamboo to this. You come back in the morning, and there's this wonderful uh, wine, this juice of the tree. It's sweet. It's a sweet juice of the palm tree. This is called tuak. And the tuak has brought in these large bamboos to the market. And after a couple of days, it gets a little alcoholic. Tuac is normally drunk with the uh, piece de resistance of this area, which is some kind of meat, pork, chicken, or water buffalo meat that's cooked inside a green bamboo. You take meat and certain kinds of aromatic leaves and a little chili peppers, put that inside the bamboo, and roast the green bamboo on a fire made only of dried bamboo, not hardwood, because the hardwood will burn through the bamboo. And then you cut open this repast, put your rice on your banana leaf, take this and put it, and then you eat this with a banana leaf in one hand, and you have your little, little small bamboo of tuak wine in the other hand, and you could have a wonderful Taraja meal. Yes? Well, it's, in, it's interesting. Like, take Japan, for I, I haven't gone to East Asia and this stuff, but take Japan. For instance, Japan has two religions, Shinto and Buddhism. Buddhism is when people die. Everybody goes to the Buddhist temple. They take care of death. Shinto, when you're like one, three, and five years old, there's all kinds of life rituals for kids. There's every year at the, uh, new, at the new year, you get amulets from the Buddhist temple, bring in your old amulets. Shinto is very much a celebration of rice. I was at a Shinto celebration a few years ago in Japan. The rice harvest was taken in, and they were celebrating. The, they, they had a business at this temple, which was making and producing sake. And the first sake is, looks like milk. It's milky white. 
It ha he still has a little grains of rice, and it hasn't been completely refined. And so everybody showed up, but this is in a mountain village called Shirakawa Go. Show up in this village, you pay the temple a little $5 fee, and they give you your everlasting sake cup. For three days, as much sake as you want to drink with everybody, the whole gang there, you can drink the sake. And the Buddhist Shinto priests come out with these copper kettles, and they, they, put it, they keep on going around and around and around. So yes, I mean, different religions. I mean, the Buddhism is a religion that's very tolerant of indigenous beliefs. So many places in mainland South Asia that are Buddhist, they have also celebrations of rice. Rice is very, is very much a part of culture throughout Southeast Asia and parts of East Asia, yeah. Do the rice farmers and the coffee plantations, is there a crop economic? No, there's no, rice coffee grows in mountains. Uh, Arabica coffee, the best kind, Vietnam's not the number two coffee producer in the world, incidentally, after Brazil. Uh, coffee grows in, in mountain areas. Uh, rice usually grows in valley areas or terrace areas. They don't compete, they don't compete for, the, for the same land. Uh, that's one thing for sure, yeah. Uh, but co coffee is, of course, a much more high-value crop. You get a lot more money for an acre of coffee than when you for an acre of, uh, of rice. But even though you might get pay thirteen ninety-five a pound for Sulawesi Kalosi beans here, there the farmers get a dollar seventy-five. Yeah. Anything else, ladies and gentlemen? Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. You didn't talk much about um, Buddhism. I, di I didn't. And, and uh, I was just wondering if you could touch on any examples of. I think they call it syncretism. Syncretism. Syncretism, syncretism is where, uh, like a Buddhist in a Buddhist country, like Japan, just for instance, you have uh, the Buddhist, uh, Shinto came first in Japan. Buddhism came with Chinese writings of about the 6th century AD. They figured out a way to get along, to have different spheres. And so uh, the uh, monotheistic religions, of which Islam, of course, is the most recent, uh, I have to say, are extraordinarily intolerant of uh, pre-monotheistic traditions, whereas Buddhism uh, can kind of embrace all, you know. Monotheistic traditions are pretty much like it's one way or the highway. Uh, Buddhism and Hinduism are oftentimes making compromises and syncretistic accretions with local, local, local traditions for sure, yeah. I wanted to not to talk about these tribal societies because here we can cut to the core and get to the essence of the sanctity of rice in Asian culture. That's why I made this presentation. So are there any examples of Islam uh, syncretizing with? Yeah, I mean, Indonesia has a lot of syncret syncretic Islamic uh, uh, ceremonies, but uh, over time, in the current environment of the world, Islam is becoming more and more uh, homogenized. And these uh, 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 compromises that have been made with local tradition are, are uh, increasingly frowned upon. Just for an example, the jihadists who took over northern Iraq are going around demolishing all the Shiite Sufi shrines in northern, northern Iraq. Or they, when they took over northern Mali, the first thing they did was demolish all the shrines to Sufi saints, which are basically have to do with pre-Islamic tradition. So, and so this, I mean, this is definitely like, a pro can be like a problem in today's world for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I just had a comment. Um, when I was growing up in India, you know, we bought our milk from the store. Yeah. But it had the rice would have like all different lengths in it. Sure. And then you'd use a big sieve to kind of get the little stuff out. Was it a sieve or was it a winnow? So you did. So it was a sieve. Uh -huh. You actually did this and the little grains would fall out. Oh. And then uh, the, the longer grains were used for like rice dishes. Yeah. And the little ones were like ground up for the dal or other things. Right. Like and idli batter. Wow, that's the then uh, now we know the Italy secret. Yeah, yeah good, yeah. good. If you, you know, didn't do that, your yeah. rice would cook unevenly because you had the little bits and the long grain all in one bag. That's very that, that's very interesting. I mean a constant thing uh seen in South East is people winnowing the rice in a winnowing basket. <laughs> but here of course this, this is becoming increasingly mechanized, even in places like where the Tarajas live now, where there's no more hand pounding. It's all done by gasoline power machines. Yeah. So one other question is that if, what's the gender um, situation of labor? Is it uh, do the men and the women do all the jobs? Uh, yeah, most of the rice fields I've seen, I see both men and women out there doing it. Well, I mean, there are many different cultures and subcultures, but generally 
race is so important to life that you generally, you're generally going to find men and women doing the labor in terms of certain kinds of offerings and religious things or certain things that women are going to do only, especially for like the rice mother among the Thai people. There are certain jobs that only the, the women can do, like taking the sacred grains back to the house and stuff. Yeah. Yeah? Is, is rice uh, in Asia nutritious enough to be the soul food? Rice is the most nutritious of the grains. It's got more protein than I think just about any other grain. Yeah, rice is rice is very nutritious, and of course it usually is eaten. No, huh? Even white. Rice. Yeah, but I mean traditionally villagers don't eat the highly polished white rice that we eat because traditionally they hull it by hand, so a lot of that bran, which has all the nutrition, stays on the rice. It's the modern milling techniques for wheat, and we started to have steel cut wheat rather than stone ground wheat. Stone ground wheat was really, really nutritious. That brown bread, now we're like getting back to it. But these modern milling techniques are what mess up the nutritional value of these grains, whether it's wheat or rice or whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have some friends in the local community from Sri Lanka. Did you have much experience with Sri Lanka and rice growing? No, I don't. I have, I have no experience. But uh, ecologically, Sri Lanka is kind of part of Southeast Asia. I mean, you know, it's ecologically like that, yeah. My space, but I've never been there, so I can't. That's a, that's a different that's a different issue between the Hindus yeah. and and the Buddhists. Uh, and oh, just one last thing, if I may. I mean, I haven't talked at all about rice policy, but like right now, a big hang-up in the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership negotiation between Japan and the United States is Japan has a 420 percent tariff on U.S. rice because they want to protect their rice harvest, because rice is so important to them that they feel they have to grow all their own rice. But the current uh, Abe, the current prime minister, and his new economic policy says we should give up on spending hundreds of millions of dollars subsidizing small rice farmers and kind of modernize our economy. So a lot of these issues that I've been talking about here, the centrality of rice to local culture, are articulated in important contemporary policy issues right at the present time. Yep. <laughs>